Let us pray. God, we ask your spirit to be with us, to open up our hearts and minds so we can receive what you have to give to us today. In these scriptures, songs we sing, words that are said, help us to know your need for who we are, your desire for who we can become. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know about you, but gifts make me nervous. You know, at Christmas or birthdays, a lot of times they're all wrapped up so you can't tell what's inside the box or the bag. All you can do is untie the ribbon or tear off the wrapping paper and you just don't know what's gonna come out of there. Sometimes everybody else knows except you. So they're all watching you to see your reaction. Will you be happy? Will you be surprised? Will you be disappointed? So are you good at receiving gifts? Do you like to be surprised? Or would you rather know ahead of time what's coming your way so you can control your response? I don't know if it's because of my near-death experience with my car wreck or that I'm just getting old, but my tears seem to be much more out of my control ever since that event. And that makes me even more scared. Somebody might see me cry. But I'm just getting used to that in my old age. One philosopher says that a true gift cannot be controlled. A true gift cannot be controlled. My family got a true gift in the memorials that were given to the church since my dad's funeral. That was about six years ago. My explanation has been that my dad subbed for all of us pastors. He was a pastor over the years. I counted up one time, there are like 73 churches in Nebraska that we Cargus pastors have served so far. So after his funeral six years ago, like $10,000 came in in memorials. We were blown away by that. Then Christ United Methodist Church in Lincoln, where mom and dad went to church, the administrative team voted to give a thousand of that to the Donovan Church, a thousand of that to the Rosedale Church, a thousand of that to the Waverly Churches, which he had served. I could not believe it. It was extravagant generosity, totally out of our control. There's so much gift stuff going on in this scripture today. See, Lazarus had just received the gift of being raised from the dead by Jesus. He didn't ask for it. It was totally out of his control. So now he's sitting down at the table for supper with Jesus. Can you imagine? If you're Lazarus, what do you say on that thank you note that you give to Jesus? How can his family express their gratitude? Well, that's the next surprise, because apparently it was a surprise to everyone that Mary kneels at the feet of Jesus, Lazarus's sister, and cracks the top off of a very, very expensive bottle of perfume and proceeds to pour it on Jesus's feet, massages his feet, then wipes it with her hair, sending the smell throughout the house. One commentator made the point that Mary was has now anointed both Lazarus and Jesus with the perfume meant to cover up the smell of death. Then some were shocked at her gift, but Jesus was just thankful. It was one of those gifts that does not last. A smell, a feeling, then it's gone. There's lots of gifts like that, like the gift of live flowers, the gift of a solo or an anthem, freshly baked bread, a good crispy cream donut, chocolate covered, custard filled, 10 seconds in the microwave. These kind of gifts are given and then they're gone 
over. And we're just left with their impact, with the feelings of gratitude. Some would say that Jesus' life itself is kind of like that. Here and alive, felt and received, and then we're left with its impact on our lives. And we're left with our gratitude. I want to share with you a wonderful story about a woman who was known far and wide for her grateful spirit. It's an old story. You probably heard it before. This woman, even when she was diagnosed with terminal illness, was told that she only had three months to live. Still, she maintained that twinkle in her eye, that terrific sense of humor, that radiant spirit of gratitude. She went to see her pastor to plan her memorial service. And with a laugh, she said to him, don't you make this somber or sad. I'll come back and haunt you if you do. I've had a great life and I'm so thankful for so many things. So let's concentrate on making this a celebration of my life in this world and the next. So together she and the pastor selected the hymns, the scriptures, and then she said, there's one more thing. I, I want to help you with your message. And the pastor said, how's that? She said, I want to be buried with a fork in my hand. The pastor blanched a little bit and said, she said, are you shocked? He said, no, I'm a little curious. And she went on to explain that in all her years in the church, she says, I've attended so many eating meetings, dinners, brunches, lunches, potluck suppers. And my favorite part is when they're clearing the tables after the main course and someone would lean over and say, keep your fork. That's my favorite part because I knew that meant something better was coming. I was so grateful for what I've already had and now something even better is coming. So when people come to the funeral home and see me there, they're gonna say, What's with the fork in her hand? And then at the service, you can get up and tell my story. And you can tell them for me, I am grateful for all that I've already had. But I'm keeping my fork because I know something even better is coming. So let me ask you, do you have that kind of victorious spirit? Do you have that kind of deep faith? Do you have that kind of extravagant gratefulness? If not, why not? Because Jesus taught us that it's okay to be extravagant in our generosity and in our gratitude. So what do we bring to worship on Sundays that is a gift of our gratitude to God for what God has done for us, loved us unconditionally, forgiven us over and over again, what is our gift of gratitude? And can you really waste a gift on Jesus? Can we be too extravagant in our gratitude? What would happen this week if we gave excessive compassion away to our families or at work? What would it be like to give ourselves with extravagant generosity like Mary did? One thing is clear, whatever meanings scholars try to attach to Mary's act of anointing Jesus with this precious oil, it was without question an act of love, an act of kindness, an act of graciousness. Mark Trotter, pastor, tells the story of Tess. Tess was a precocious little eight-year-old girl. One day she heard her mom and dad talking in serious and somber tones about her little brother, Andrew. Tess didn't understand everything they were saying, but she got the gist of it. Her little brother, Andrew, was very, very sick and they were completely out of money. They would have to move out of their house, move into a small apartment because mom and dad didn't have enough money for the doctor bills and the house payment. On top of that, only a very expensive surgery could save Andrew now. And they could not find anyone to lend them the money. And just then, Tess heard her dad say to her tearful mother in whispered desperation, only a miracle can save Andrew now. Tess ran to her room, pulled out a glass jelly jar from its hiding place in her closet. She poured out all the change onto the floor and counted it. She then put the change back in the jar, put the jar under her arm, slipped out the back door, and ran down the block to the Rexall drugstore. 
And the pharmacist, when she got there, was talking to a man intently, and he didn't notice Tess standing there. And she waited patiently for a while, and then she dramatically cleared her throat, but still no luck. The pharmacist didn't see her. Finally, Tess got his attention by taking a quarter out of her jelly jar and then tapping it against the glass counter. Then he heard her and noticed her and said, just a minute, I'm talking to my brother from Chicago. I haven't seen him for ages. And Tess said, well, I want to talk to you about my brother. He's really, really sick, and I want to buy a miracle. His name's Andrew. He's something growing in his head, and my daddy says only a miracle can save him now. So how much does a miracle cost? I have the money here to pay for it. It's all I've saved. If it isn't enough, I'll get the rest. Just tell me how much a miracle costs. And the pharmacist's brother was a well-dressed man. He stooped down and asked Tess, what kind of miracle does your brother need? And Tess said, I don't know. Her eyes were welling up. I just know he's really, really sick. And mommy says he needs an operation, but my parents can't pay for it. So I want to use my money. How much do you have? Said the man from Chicago. One dollar and 11 cents, Tess said. It's all the money I have in the world, but I can get some more if I need to. Well, you're in luck, the man said. One dollar and 11 cents is the exact price for a miracle for little brothers. He took the money in one hand, took a hold of her little mitten in his other, and said, take me to where you live. I want to see your brother and meet your parents. Let's see if I have the kind of miracle you need. Because see, that well-dressed man from Chicago was Dr. Carton Armstrong, who happened to be a noted neurosurgeon. And the operation was successfully completed. And there was no charge. It wasn't long till Andrew was home again and doing well. And Tessa's mom and dad were so grateful Talking one night about the chain of events that saved Andrew's life. That surgery, her mom said, was a real miracle. She just said, I wonder how much it would have cost. And a little Tess smiled because she knew exactly how much that miracle cost. One dollar and eleven cents. Plus the skill and graciousness of a great doctor. And of course, the gracious sacrificial love of an eight-year-old big sister. Someone might say, well, it's only $1.11, but it was all she had. She gave all she had to save her little brother. That's an extravagant gift. It's a great story. Reverend Trotter is known for his great stories. It's powerful because it reminds me in a dramatic way that the Spirit of Christ can empower us and enable us to be extravagant in our generosity, to be extravagant in our gratitude, to be extravagant in our graciousness. Amen.